Now, therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and nursing babes. Let the priest who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. Please stand for our invocation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to experience your presence in this sanctuary among your people. We invite you to draw close in a way that inspires and transforms. Father, may your word not return to you void. And may your ears be pleased with the praise that comes from the hearts and the lips of those who want to know you and those who love you. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Let everyone say, amen. amen. Remain standing for our opening hymn, Amazing Grace, hymn number 108, hymn 108.
Good morning, church family. We're happy to have you here today. And if you're looking for a church home, please uh, let us know of your interest. The little purple cards in the pew will give you information to uh, give your information to us so that we know uh, who you are. This morning, we um, have a, a number of announcements that are important. Uh, take note of your announcement page in the bulletin. But first of all, I want you to know that uh, just two weeks from tomorrow is the annual Crop Walk. The Crop Walk is a hunger walk where we raise funds here. All the churches in Glendale who participate, there's about 20 some churches. Uh, people get pledges and uh, money is, uh, gets taken, uh, most of it overseas, about 75% of it, but 25% of it stays right here in Glendale and our thrift shop across the street gets a good check each year from the crop walk to help feed the hungry. We have a video and we'll show you at this time uh, about the crop walk. We want to invite you to be part of this crop walk. We have a challenge for every walker who signs up through the Vallejo Drive Church. There will be a hundred dollar donation to this fund. So you can sign up either online you, uh, with the um, website that's in the bulletin or you can register after church in the lobby. So please uh, plan on doing that. You can uh, also uh, get pledges to support your walk as well. Members of the personnel committee of the church uh, will meet about 15 minutes after the service today in the fellowship hall for a quick lunch and a meeting afterward. In the history of a church community, there are always times of change and an end of an era. Today is one of those times. Today officially ends an era for the Vallejo Drive Church. I'm saddened to announce that Elizabeth Rembold, our organist and director of music, has turned in her resignations for health reasons. Elizabeth has tirelessly served this church for 29 years. Her passion for excellence and deep desire to enhance our worship experience has blessed us beyond measure. Each week she has dedicated many long hours of preparation and practice to make the worship service a blessing and an inspirational experience to this church community. At a date to be determined in the future, we will have a farewell for her and thank her for her service. I ask you to remember Liz in your prayers as she moves to this new chapter in her life. I'd like to welcome our guest speaker today, Jonathan Henderson. Jonathan's a dynamic young man, a preacher in great demand all across our college campuses and uh, occasionally for camp meetings and, and young adult uh, activities. He's a chaplain at PUC and uh, currently has been a pastor in the past. And we're delighted that he can come and share a message with us today. So Jonathan, we welcome you to the Vallejo Drive Church. Children's Choir.
Thank you, boys and girls. If you'd be seated and the rest of the children, come on up for the children's story. And it's time for all you adults to stand to your feet, reach those hands out, and give someone a greeting and maybe even a hug. Okay, good morning, boys and girls. Oh no, you're not ready. Good morning, boys and girls. It's great to see you this morning. My name is Melissa, and I'll be telling your story this morning. I am happy that you are here, and I am thankful for the ones who sang this song. You sung very, very, very lovely, and I would love to hear you another time. Now, today we want to talk about temptation. Can anybody tell me what temptation is? Just put your hands up quickly, yes? When you're tempted to do something. Okay, when you're tempted to do something. Anybody else, just one more? Anybody else wanna tell me what temptation is? Okay, it's that little voice in your head that tells you to do something you know that isn't right. Like, for example, what do you think I have in my hand here? Can anybody guess what this is? Candy yes. Yes, there are candies. There's lollipop, there's chocolate, and there's a little white one with a rose. It's probably some kind of flavor. So let's take, for example, your mom has a big bowl of sweets on the table, and I want you to imagine this in your mind, and she tells you not to touch any. Don't take any candy before dinner because it's going to spoil your appetite. But then there's a little voice in your head that tells you, you know what, go take one. She will not miss it, and it won't spoil your appetite. Now that's temptation. Now, another example, you're at school, you have a test on Monday, but you forgot to revise, you forgot to spell your words over the weekend, and you're at your desk with your pen and paper, and teacher said it's time for our test. You didn't prepare, but you can see your neighbor's paper. And you, a little voice comes in your head and says, you know what, look over in the paper and you can copy what's over there. Now that's temptation, but what about if you're at a supermarket with your mom or your dad, and someone drops their money. And the person keeps walking, and you see them drop their money. A little voice will come to your head and say, pick up the money, nobody will see, and put it quickly in your pocket. You know who it belongs to. Should you pick it up, keep it in your pocket, or should you pick it up and give it to the rightful owner? Now, Jesus, when he was finished being baptized, his cousin John, uh, and after God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm very well pleased, he was led into the wilderness, an area where there was just lots of grass or sand and animals and so on. And he went there for 40 days. He didn't eat anything and he didn't drink any water. And the devil was there waiting to tempt him. And the first temptation the devil brought him, guess what he said to him? You see those st stones, those nice, round, smooth stones? You can turn them into bread because you're hungry. You haven't eaten for days. And guess what Jesus said to him? He remembered what he learned from his mommy telling him about what is written in scripture. And he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but he shall also live by the word that comes out of the mouth of God. So the devil got defeated with that one. And then the devil took him up to the high mountain and said, you see all those lovely cities, Riverside and Los Angeles and, and all those nice areas, Glendale and so on, I will give them to you. 
if you should bow down and worship me. And he's tempting Jesus again. And guess what Jesus said to him? You shall not worship, you shall not worship anybody else, only the Lord your God. The devil said, I didn't get him then again. Let me try one more time. So he took him high up on a temple. Let's say he took him high up above our church, on the very top of our church roof. And he said to Jesus, look, throw yourself down. You know you're the Father's God in heaven is going to send angels to catch you so that you won't hurt yourself. You won't break your arm or you won't break your leg. And then Jesus again remember what his mommy told him about in the scriptures and from the Bible. He said, to, he said to the devil, get thee away from me. You must never tempt the Lord your God. Now when that little voice comes into your head to tell you to do something that is not right, you must always remember what you learned in Sabbath school, especially from this story. Tell the devil to get away. You will not listen to him because he will get you into trouble. All right? Now we're going to bow our heads and close our eyes and have one of you to pray for us so that we can ask God to help us be better and be good when temptation comes. Anybody else wants here? Anybody here wants to do a prayer quickly? Just a short prayer? Okay, well, I will pray. Next time you'll pray for me. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes. Our God in heaven, we thank you for Jesus who came and died for us. We thank you for showing us how we can overcome the devil and the temptations that he will bring to us. I pray that you will strengthen our little ones even strengthen our big ones likewise, who is also listening to the story. Bless us today. Help us to have a wonderful day in your name and through your son, Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, you may go now. Good morning, and happy Sabbath to everybody here. Uh, it is time this morning to, um, to give something back to God. Uh, God is uh, providing us so many things uh, on this week that we have the opportunity now to give something back to Him. It is time to collect the offerings. So I would like to invite the deacons forward so they can collect the offering today. Um, and letting you know that the offering today um, is a church budget so we're encouraging you and inviting you to to give for this church so whatever you know this church needs you know it can be provided and it can be um, supplied by by God first so the deacons can start collecting the offering
thank you for this amazing opportunity that you gave us to us to give you something back to you. Lord, we ask you to um, bless every single person in this place to provide them not only economically, God, but physically, help uh, to provide everything they need. In Jesus' name we pray this morning. Amen. invite you, all those in the pews, as much as possible, uh, to kneel for our morning prayer. <laughs> our Heavenly Father, we gather to worship, to honor you, who has given us life, salvation, and eternal hope through the gospel of Jesus Christ. We come to honor your name, which alone is worthy to be praised and exalted. Today, our hearts and minds are drawn to you, for we seek spiritual renewal through the power of your word and the inspiration of worship. We're not worthy to come into your presence because of our self-centered and willful ways, but through Jesus, you have made the way that we may enter boldly into your presence and that we may ask that you would water us, water our thirsty souls with the living water of your spirit and feed our hungry minds with the bread of your word. Forgive us our sin of not trusting you fully. Forgive us for our acts of willfulness and misrepresenting you. Renew us and make us into your image. Take our thoughts and wills and mind, mold them into your ways and the mind of Jesus. When we look at our world today, we recognize that we are living in very serious and very dangerous times. Our hearts are aching with the school tragedy in Florida. We feel the ever-growing tensions between people and ideologies. 
We need the peace that only you can give. We ask that you direct the decisions of the human leaders, both in the secular and religious realms, into actions that will reflect your will and purposes. May we also be willing to follow your daily directions. We think of the many people in our community, in our church family, and who have needs, and we pray for them. We pray that you would bless, guide, heal, comfort, protect, as needed in each case. Today, we praise you that your life will be shared with each willing heart. Bless your servant, Jonathan Henderson, as he shares with us this morning's message. Now may your spirit enable us through your word to bring a blessing, faith and hope and love in Jesus Christ, our Lord. We ask in his name, amen. Let's read the Bible in Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 15. And it's come to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized for John in Jordan and straight when coming up. Up of the water he saw the heaven opened and the spirit like a dove descended upon him. And then came a voice from heaven, saying, Do are my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And immediately thy spirit driven in into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness forty days tempting for Satan. And what with the wild beats and the angels minister unto him. Now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom for God, and saying, The type is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repenting and believe the gospel. Amen. Good morning, and happy Sabbath. Feliz Sábado. I am going to switch to this mic. Is that okay? All right. Let me make sure it's on. Okay, we're good. That's good. See, if, I'm, if I stay tethered to this pulpit, I probably wouldn't be able to talk. Um, I am really happy to be here with you this morning. Uh, you may not know this, but Glendale is actually one of my favorite places in this country. Seriously, I, 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 I grew up in Southern California, but I have one big problem with Southern California. Sometimes there's not enough green and there's too much smog. And for some reason, Glendale seems to be this like cove or something of sorts where I don't see as much smog and I see lots and lots of green. So I'm always happy here. It's my favorite part about Northern California and it, it is my favorite part about Glendale. Hey, so we are starting a new series um, this, this Sabbath and I am the one that gets to start it off. So hopefully I, I don't point you in the wrong direction. Um, we're on our road to Calvary, to the cross, and the church is focusing on prayer and fasting. And I've been given the text in Mark 1. Um, 
But I have to be honest with you. Mark 1 is good, but Mark 2 is even better. So we're going to touch on Mark 1, but we're going to land in Mark 2, if you don't mind. Is that okay? Okay. I can see that we're not going to have a conversation here. Is that okay? All right. Good, good, good. Um, I'm in the NIV, and uh, we just read the text, so you should already be there. Um, I see my young people in the balcony. Yes, we were in Sabbath school together for like 10 minutes. Yes, yes. And you guys are going to stay focused, right? All right, good. Okay, so we're in Mark chapter 1. And before I begin, I want to thank uh, Pastor Mark and Pastor Shane. I want to thank Audrey for, for picking me up at the airport. Um, it is, again, good to be here. And a lot of moving parts. And this happened almost um, last minute. So this was not in the calendar for, I think, longer than a week or a week and a half. So I'm glad we were able to work it out for, for me to be able to join you and to worship with you. So we're in Mark uh, chapter 1, and I'm reading from the NIV. I just want to focus on one verse before we pray. It says that Jesus went into Galilee in verse 14, and he was proclaiming the good news of God. The good news of of God. The time has come, in the Greek, the kairos, the appointed time. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Repent and believe the good news. Let us pray. Father, we thank you uh, that we get to experience this special holiday every single week. This holiday, this holy day that you created just for us, according to Mark chapter 2, that it was made for us. And so, Father, on this day, as you, as you sing over your creation, as Zephaniah 3 says, Father, we sit back and we accept it. Ascribe us worth. Remind us of who we are and our value in your eyes. And, Father, as we open our hearts and our ears to your word, Father, we want an encounter that we never forget. Make that a reality. And these things we ask in Jesus' name, let everyone say, amen and amen. The good news. Jesus does this right after, right after his baptism and right after the temptations in the wilderness. Now, I'm not going to stay on the temptations in the wilderness too long because it was already uh, shared in the children's story, so there's no need to, to repeat that. But, but most of us are familiar with this story, that, that Jesus is baptized by his cousin John, who was his, uh, was his hype man, was the one that prepared the way for Jesus uh, first advent. And when Christ comes, John sees him and says, ah, worthy is the lamb. This is, this is the lamb that has come to take away the sins of the world, and I'm not even worthy enough to lace his sandals. John tells Jesus, you should be baptizing me. But Christ, in order to fulfill scriptures, is baptized. And, and as soon as he comes up out of the water, the Bible tells us that, that, that the heavens open up. And you hear this voice that says, this is my boy. This is my son. And I'm so pleased with him. I love this part because the father says he's pleased with his son before his son ever preaches a word. The father says he's pleased with his son before his son ever performs a miracle. The father says he's pleased with his son and he loves him before he carries a cross for you and me. Often we have learned growing up that our value comes from things that we do, that our value comes from even being obedient that our value and our worth is somehow tied to our accomplishments. And I love the fact that just Jesus being there, just Jesus being his son is enough for the father to say, I love you and I'm pleased with you. Too often we praise our children only when they do the right thing and not simply for just being who they are. Now you may think this is, something I'm just kind of pulling out of the hat. But it is actually at the center of the gospel. Knowing who you are is the most important thing that we should walk away when we're reading the Bible. 
You still don't believe me. What was Lucifer's issue in heaven? He did not know who he was. The problem is, is that he was not certain of his value. He was not certain of his worth. And the reason why Satan, Lucifer falls, is because he had it twisted. Satan had got into the place where he had seen himself in a light that was false. And when he tempts Adam and Eve, how does he attempt to do so? He attacks them in the same vein. Take this fruit, and if you eat it, you will become like God. Now, interesting enough, Adam and Eve were already like God, so they were being tempted to become something they already were. God-likeness was something they had as soon as God breathed the breath of life into them. But yet the enemy comes and he tests them and he tells them, you think you're like God. Yeah, you may kind of look like God and maybe there are certain attributes that are like God. But if you really want to be like him, like equal with him. See, I had this problem when I was in heaven. God got intimidated. It's all-star week in here in L.A. So you guys can probably roll with this illustration. See, God got, uh, he got a little intimidated. MJ. Michael Jesus got intimidated because I, LeBron James, I thought I was better. And he got threatened. He got threatened by my skills. He got threatened by my abilities. He got, a, he got threatened by my influence. God was intimidated by me. And so he kicked me out. But listen, I have the secret potion. If you take this fruit, you will become just like him, and God will then be afraid of you as well. You will be able to make up your own mind. You will be able to be the master of your destiny. You will be able to have control. Just trust me, take this fruit. That was the temptation. The temptation is not to eat to satisfy your hunger. The temptation is to eat in order to be like God. So when we find ourselves here in the wilderness, after Jesus hears the voice, but this is my son in whom I am well pleased, Jesus is feeling pretty good about this. Thank you, Dad. I haven't heard your voice in like 30 years. This is great, wonderful. The first plan of action, the first item on the agenda is to go into a wilderness and be tested by Satan. And what does the, ta the, the temptation, the test center around? You're going to think appetite, right? Turn these stones into bread because Jesus had not eaten in many, many days, right? 40 days. That's not the temptation. The temptation is this, according to Matthew, if you are the son of God, that's the temptation. If you are the son of God turn these stones into bread. If you are the son of God, throw yourself off the top of this church and the angels, they will attend to you. The angels will rescue you. They will prove that you are truly the son of God because they won't even allow you to stub your own toe. So, so prove it. If you are the son of God, how many things do we do family? How many things do we do in order to prove who we are? Think about it. At the heart of most of our struggles, our sins, our, our, our temptations, our failures, is this, this, this need, this insatiable need to prove our worth and our value and who we are. Peer pressure centers around you having to prove yourself in order to gain something. I want to be popular. I want, I want my classmates to like me. I want people to think that I'm pretty. I want people to think that I'm smart. I want everyone to know that I am successful. So we make decisions based on how it is going to impact people's perception of who we are. Listen, I grew up in the church, so you can't fake it with me. I know the game. I know exactly the kind of disagreements you have at home and on the drive to church and before you walk through the doors no, don't, 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 don't. Okay. hi happy sabbath oh uh, how are you doing oh i've had a wonderful week oh i know the game don't you tell anybody what's happening okay you understand me don't tell anybody can you imagine going to a hospital? Think about this, going to the hospital and you are sick. You need intervention. Going to the hospital and telling your family, don't you tell them that I need help. 
don't you dare, don't you dare. Can you imagine taking your children to the hospital? They need intervention. Don't you tell the doctor where it hurts. Don't you dare. We are going to pretend that we are healthy and we are well. Oh, hi, doctor. We don't even need to see you. We're good. So good. If you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, prove it by what you can do. Turn these stones into bread. If you are the son of God, prove it by how others value you, how the angels value you, by what they say about you. Prove it. If you are the son of God, then you can't have nothing. You have to be a, a ruler of the nations. Well, I have all these nations. I know why you came, Jesus. I'll give you what you want. I'll give you back the world. And then you can prove you're a king. But let me tell you something. Your value does not come from what you do. Your value does not come from what others say or think of you. And your value does not come from what you have. You had immeasurable value the day you were conceived. The Bible says that God knew us while we were in our mother's womb. He knew us. There was nothing we said, nothing that we did, and God valued you. Now, some of you can connect with this because you've had children. And do you remember what it was like before you were struggling with, again, people's perceptions and wanting to think that your children were perfect? Do you remember what it was like the first time you held your child in your arms? Do you remember that feeling? And that child had done nothing for you, nothing at all. In fact, ladies, you might have had some anger with what was happening inside before the child was born. But when you hold that baby in your arms, what are the feelings that you have? Someone would describe a love that was unbreakable. I've heard mothers say, I loved my child instantly. And I would do anything to protect her, anything to protect him. I know that's not everybody's experience. I know there's, there are some other stories where, oh man, we live in a world of sin and there is brokenness and sometimes that even, that even creeps into this situation. But I would say that the normal experience, the, on average, the experience is one of elation and love. And even though that child has done nothing for you. And then, watch this. Then you go through the first week. You know how that goes, right? Child doesn't want you to sleep at all. Now, for me, I am one of those people that I loved being awakened in the middle of the night with my son's cry. I loved it. Every time he cried, I said, yes, I'm a daddy. I hear you, son. I hear you. I loved picking him up. I loved rocking him. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. And you know, after a first year, of having him, you know what we did? And I don't know why people do this, but we did it too. We had a birthday. We had a birthday and we celebrated his life. And we sang songs and we danced and we just hugged him and we gave him gifts. And you know what's really interesting? He didn't do anything that year that earned it. Nope. All he did was take hours of sleep. He stressed us out a number of times. It cost us a lot of money. There was tension in our marriage because of him. Can I be honest with you? So why in the world are we celebrating him? And then by year two, you would think it gets better, but no, he cost even more. And we're still singing songs and we're still giving him gifts. I would think on birthdays, children should be paying their parents, hello? Thank you, mom. Thank you, dad, for keeping me alive. I know I didn't make any contribution at all. Who should I write the check out to, mom or dad? Just mom? Okay. Right? But this is what we do as parents. We celebrate our kids. And listen, God is the exact same way. When Adam and Eve were created, the very next move that God makes is what? Anyone? He has a birthday celebration. That's what the Sabbath is, right? That's what the Sabbath is. It is a celebration 
of God going through six days of labor. My wife went through 28 hours of labor. God went through six days of labor, gave birth to all that is in the world and celebrated it the very next day. That's what the Sabbath is. It is a glorified birthday. Happy birthday to you. This is God celebrating. This is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter. I'm so pleased. Oh, no, 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 you're not working. No, you're not. Sit down right now. No working. This day is special. It's holy. It's set apart. Oh, you rest. That's what the commandment was. And it's so interesting because on my birthday, when I was told not to wash dishes, I never complained. Every holiday, and major holiday in this country is still patterned after the original Sabbath. You know that? No work. Convocation coming together as people and eating. Every single holiday. That is the three main ingredients of the Sabbath. Read Nehemiah 8. Rest, convocation, getting your grub on. God celebrates you at the very beginning before you ever say a word. The value that God has placed on your life is so critical for you to understand it because you keep trying to earn it. There is nothing that you can do right now or in the future that can make God love or accept you more and nothing that you can do that would make him love you less. And I know that messes with your mind because you like competition and you want to be able to measure. I would tell my mom, I said, mom, look at my drawing. Isn't it wonderful? And my little brother would do his little drawing and it didn't make any sense at all. He was trying to copy me, but his drawing was whack. And then he'd go to my mom and say, mommy, look at my drawing. And I'd say, mom, whose drawing is better? You know what my mom would say? It still gets me annoyed sometimes. You know what my mom would say? I love them both the same. No, I know. Okay, mom, but which one's better? I, they're both beautiful. I was like, okay, mom, you can tell that mine is a puppy, right? You can't tell what that is, all right? We don't even know what Greg's drawing is, but my drawing, you can tell what it is. Which one's better? I love them both the same. I love you guys both the same. I just love you all. But what does life look like when we no longer wake up trying to prove ourselves? What must I do to be saved? What must I do? And Jesus is like, man, why are you talking about being good? There's only one who is good. So can you give this part up? No, 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 I can do it, I can do it. Tell me, good teacher, what good thing must I do to be saved? Why are you talking to me about being good? There's only one who is good, only one, only one, only one. Do you guys hear that? only one. Well, no, but Pastor Henderson, when the Holy Spirit is inside of you, then you can be good as well. I have yet to meet a good person. Have you met a good person? You're going to say, well, yeah, I married her, <laughs> right? Jesus says, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Has your spouse ever borne bad fruit? So if they born bad fruit, they can't be a good tree. So the question is again, have you ever met a good person? I'm sure that most of the good things we do are probably for bad reasons. Don't worry, I won't come back here again. I'm just saying, there's only one good tree. The only thing we could ever hope to be is a branch connected to that tree, that's it. But a good tree, you might as well forget it. A branch grafted into the stock of, of Christ? Yes, we have a shot. May we be one of the branches connected to the real vine, Jesus Christ, amen? That we may bear much fruit. But even us bearing fruit, the branch doesn't brag. The branch is not like, yo, look at all this fruit I got. I am so amazing. Because the branch can do nothing without the vine. That's why Christ used the illustration in John 15. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So remain in me, and I will remain in you, that you may bear much fruit. So if anyone is fruitful in their life, it is not because of their good works. It's not because of their, their good character. It is not because they're more proficient. It is because they have remained connected to the only one who is good, and that is Jesus Christ. 
So Satan fails these temptations. I mean, Satan fails of his temptations. He fails because Jesus is certain of who he is. So when Satan comes at him and says, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, Christ keeps saying, yo, it is written. Come on now. You heard what my daddy said about me. Come on, stop trying. Why, why are you hating so much? Why are you? You're such a hater. Satan, you're such a hater, bro. Like, why are you coming at me like this? I already know who I am. I'm not confused. I know my value. I know my worth. I know who I belong to. It is not what I do or what I have or what people say. It's what my father does. It's what he has said. It's what he has. I'm good. So this is when Jesus goes to preach the gospel after this encounter. He preaches the gospel. And it's very interesting because we don't understand what the good news is. Do you know what the good news is? Anybody willing to say what the good news is? That we should be proclaiming? That we should be, that we should be spreading all throughout Glendale? What is the good news? It's interesting that we still don't have like a really solid understanding of that, right? Good news. People say, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. That sounds great. Jesus saves. What does that mean? Well, it means that everything that uh, he needed to do in order to save you, he's already done. Now he's just waiting on you. Right? That sounds like the right answer. Okay, so that's the good news is that God is really great and I got to do something on my end so that I can be then what? Saved? That I can be accepted? I can be loved? In Mark chapter 2, watch this. In Mark chapter 2, again, Jesus is preaching the gospel. People are being impacted by it. And in, the gospel, in the gospel of Mark chapter 2, verse 1, it says, A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home, and they gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. How much room was left? How much room did the Bible say was left? No room. Can I just su suggest something real quick? When Christ is in the house, there is no room left. When Christ shows up and he's in the house, people actually want to come and see him. This idea that as time draws to an end, um, that people will actually shun the good news, that, they, that they, they won't want to hear the gospel of the kingdom, it will actually be a repellent, is not factual. The Bible actually tells us that when Jesus would go to places, that people would show up. And they would show up in great numbers. Because Christ himself was attractive. The message of Jesus was attractive. The message of the kingdom was attractive. I'm tired of people trying to paint Christianity as something that is so difficult, so encumbersome, just so, so grueling that, that no one would really want to travel the straight and narrow. It's just so difficult and so hard. It's so narrow, pastor. And, and, and sin, it's so easy. And sin, it's so broad. And sin, you know, you can have more fun doing that. It is a lie. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. Take my burden upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is... Is that the Bible? Those are Jesus' own words. Christianity is easier than any other institution, any other practice, any other discipline, any other religion. There is nothing easier, nothing lighter than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing. But the Bible says straight and narrow, Pastor. Yes, because straight and narrow makes sense. Wake up. Which path do you really want to take? The straight line or this kind of like wide, crowded, trafficy path that everybody gets log jammed in? There's nothing worse than trying to go up a hill because you can't go up a hill straight line. You know that, right? It would be too steep. So going up a hill, you have to do this wide, windy stuff all the way up, zigzag up the hill. It's like only four miles to get up to the top, but because you have to zigzag all around, it'll take you 40 minutes. The quickest path anywhere is a straight line. But no, but Christ said that the, the door was narrow. The gate was narrow and few find it. The gate is narrow because it's person. That's why it's narrow. It's not a bunch of rules. It's narrow because it's a person. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the gate. 
That's why it's narrow. Because what the Jews had done is given all these rules, all these things they had to accomplish in order to come before God. And then Christ says, me, I'm that way. There's only one. That's why it's narrow. Few find it because we're all looking for more. We're all looking for the extra stuff. We're all looking for extra credit when it's just one. When I go to churches, people say, Pastor, the problem with our church is we're, we're not preaching the straight testimonies anymore. Listen, I love Auntie Ellen. I, I, listen, I am, I am where I am today because of those red books, because of the spirit of prophecy. I am here. But let me tell you something right now. The straight testimony is Jesus Christ. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. Is that Bible? The spirit of prophecy, according to John, is the testimony of Jesus Christ. It has always been Jesus. All of our doctrine, they all point back to Jesus. Everything points back to Christ. According to Paul and Colossians, according to the author of Hebrews, these are all shadows of things to come. The reality has always been Jesus Christ. So when we're talking about knowing how to live in these last days, know Jesus. I want to be prepared for the last days. Yes, yes. You can get those emails that tell us that the Pope is playing golf with the president and now you feel more prepared. But let me tell you, the way to be prepared for Jesus' soon return is for Jesus to be known in your life. Eternal life is that you may know him. That's what eternal life is. The five foolish virgins, why are they not permitted in the house? Is it because they didn't have enough oil? Is it because they weren't good enough? Why does the bridegroom say they're not allowed to come into the house? Only one reason. He doesn't say they're too late. He doesn't say they weren't good enough. And he doesn't say they didn't have enough oil. He says one thing, I don't know you, period. How about the other ones in Matthew 7 who say, Lord, Lord, did we not perform many miracles? Did we not cast out demons? Did we not, what? Did we not prophesy? Did we not do all these things in your name? These were prophets. These were, these were, these were uh, exorcists. These, these were people uh, performing miracles. They even had faith. And Christ says, yes, you did all these things. Yes, Judas, you did all these things, but I never knew you. So we can do all these things even as believers. We can do all these things. Even the demons believe and they tremble. We can do all these things and yet still not know Jesus. The reason why the five foolish ones aren't permitted into the house is because they're not known and they don't know the bridegroom. Had they known the bridegroom, this is my opinion. Can I share my opinion? Is that okay? Well, I have the mic. Uh, uh, the reason why I believe, the reason why I believe that, that, that they weren't allowed is because they did not know the bridegroom. And here's the evidence. What they should have done when they found out they didn't have enough oil is not run to a, 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 an, a Walmart that was open. They should have run to the bridegroom. They should have said to the bridegroom, we didn't bring enough, but we just trust in you that your grace is sufficient. And we know you so well, we are certain that you planned for us not being prepared enough. We bet you have some oil in the, in the closet. And all those stories of the, of, the, of the wedding celebration, the garments, what's necessary to be prepared for the wedding, the bridegroom always had. We're only permitted before God because of his grace. Nothing that we add to it at all. And when you know Jesus, when you know Jesus, you'll know that. Lucifer's great sin in heaven wasn't that he was lying. It wasn't that he was deceiving. It wasn't that he was covetous. That wasn't his great sin. His great sin is that he would not trust in the mercy and grace of God. Sister White says that God had forgiven him of all the things that he had done, patriarchs and prophets. You got to read it for yourself. That, that he was willing to give him back his position even after he had lied, even after he had coveted, even after he had, had done all the things that were breaking him uh, uh, and, and harming the harmony of heaven. And, and he almost took his position back. But pride wouldn't permit him. His distrust in the person of God, who his character is, what his character is. It's important who we know. So the Bible tells us this, and we'll wrap up. The Bible tells us this, that the, the house is packed. The house is absolutely packed because Jesus draws everybody. The Bible says if he's lifted up, he will draw how many? 
all. You know what that word in the Greek means? All. So Christ, Christ is front and center and everyone packs out the house. Everyone packs out the house. Even the story of the 5,000 uh, 5, families that Jesus feeds, that was when he was actually trying to get away from people because his cousin had been, had been murdered and, and he wanted to get away to a lonely place and 5,000 families show up. That's how popular Jesus is. That's how popular the gospel is. And so they all pack the house out. The Bible says that there are four men bringing their friend who's a paralytic to Jesus, but they can't get to Christ because of the crowd. Now, this is what I want to make sure that you understand, and I'll leave. Too often, the crowd gets in the way of people seeing Jesus. Too often, the crowd gets in the way of people knowing Christ. Too often, the church can get in the way of people knowing Jesus. Too often when people come to hear about our Savior, they question their value and their worth. And too often, we are the ones that twist the knife in their soul, in their hearts, by reminding them how they have failed and how they have fallen short and, and how they're quite not there yet and, and how they need to do this and do that in order for God to accept them. Family, if this is a hospital, if this is truly indeed a hospital, we accept sick people all the time. There is no hospital that I know of. I know our hospital right here does not say you're too sick for us to see you. Right? Right? We don't do the same. We should not do the same. Our church door should be open for everyone, even the people that we consider to sin flagrantly and don't even care that they're sinners and, 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 and brag about it. Even those individuals who, 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 who don't know Christ the way that you know Christ, even more so, they should have a bed here at the hospital. And when they come into the hospital, can I just give you a suggestion here? Don't be the doctor. Don't prescribe. Because you want to know why? You're also a patient. <gasps> you also have one of those gowns with your stuff all exposed. So don't grab their clip chart and try to diagnose them and tell them what they need to do or else. Let the physician do that. He's trained to do that. The Holy Spirit's sole responsibility, watch this, according to John, his sole responsibility is to convict and to comfort. And watch this, and to defend. The paraclete in the Greek is the advocate. He is the one, he is, he's the defense attorney. He's the one that helps protect people's heart from abuse. The Holy Spirit is there to, to, to defend us from people that would condemn us. The Holy Spirit convicts. The Holy Spirit does not condemn. Are you listening? There's a difference. The word repentance means a changing of mind, a turning away because we become convinced, not because we're bullied into repenting, not because we're overcome with God's strength into repentance. It's because God in his sweet and precious and loving and compassionate way knows how to turn the hearts of sinners. That's what our reading was in Joel. So what we do as patients in this hospital is we tell the person that's in the bed right next to us, hey, the doctor, he's awesome. That's all you have to do. <laughs> he's awesome. Well, what did he do for you? Oh, girl, oh, I was a mess. And he's still working on me. But all I'm here to tell you is that, listen, he's thorough. He's going to do, do everything that's necessary. And some patients, it's going to take a little bit longer. So get out of their room if you don't have the right attitude. But pastor, my son, he's doing drugs and he's coming to this church and I just told him he can he cannot lie to God like that. Yes, he actually can because you lie to God. I lie to God. We're all a bunch of liars. And young people, your excuse about, oh, I can't come to church because everybody's a hypocrite. You're a hypocrite too. 
Yes, you are. You're just as fake. You play games as well. You're just young. That's all. You're just a little cuter. That's all. We all do this. This is, look at, this is who we are. Oh, but the church is just full of just people that are just backstabbers. Listen, there are backstabbers at Chuck E. Cheese. They're everywhere. I used to work at Chuck E. Cheese. I was Chuck E. Cheese. I'm sorry if, I, if there's the kids here that didn't know that. Chuck E. Cheese is real. I, they're everywhere, everywhere. There's hypocrites everywhere. There's people who are fake everywhere, everywhere. The church is no different. We just claim to know somebody who can help us. And that's why we come. So when people come in with their paralysis and their friends are bringing them, get out of the way, please. I'm not sure exactly what happens here, but the Bible says they couldn't get to Christ, so they did something that, I don't know, a little disrespectful. But the Bible says they come boldly, right? They come boldly before the throne of God. They just took it literally, and they begin to rip apart the roof in order to lower their friend before Jesus. One of the things I want to encourage you on this journey of prayer and fasting as you're moving towards the cross is that persistence is absolutely necessary. Prayer is not as, listen, I love, I love liturgy. I love it. But sometimes prayer is just bloody and sweaty and people's legs get broken. Are you listening to me? Some people after a whole night of wrestling with God get messed up. Prayer all throughout scripture has people that contend with God. In fact, the word, the name Israel, you want to know what it means in the Hebrew? The name Israel means one who wrestles with God and prevails. Prayer is persistent. Prayer does not give up. Jesus tells the parable in Luke 18 to teach them that they should always pray and never become discouraged. And it's the prayer about, it's it's the prayer of the widow to the judge. Help me out, help me out. And the wicked judge says, no, 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 no. And she says, I'm going to keep coming and I'm going to wear you down. And sure enough, the judge says, if I don't give this woman what she wants, she will wear me down. And Christ says, listen to what the wicked judge says. How much more will God come to your defense? How much more? It's all throughout scripture, persistence. So young people, do not give me that excuse. Oh, but my parents said this, and you know, church is boring, and I don't want to do this. Listen, if you have to tear apart the roof, do whatever you have to do. Just don't let it be an excuse that people got in the way. You want to see Jesus? Do what Zacchaeus did. He didn't say, oh, everybody's taller than me. Everybody's more righteous than me. I guess I should go home. He says, no, I'm going to climb a tree. No excuses. I'm going to climb a tree. The Bible says that they, they, they tear apart the roof, they lower their friend before Jesus, and I'll leave you with this. The Bible says that Jesus saw their faith. He saw their faith. And Jesus' first words, which are the most important words, he says, my brother, your sins are forgiven. That is the good news. You are forgiven. Now watch this. The man was still a paralytic. In fact, Christ doesn't even give any any indication he's going to heal him. All he does is to see the man there and his friends are out of breath. (laughs) They don't even get a word out. Jesus sees their faith anyways. Oh, you guys tore apart that roof. You better pay for that. (laughs) and Jesus looks at the paralytic and he gives the man exactly what he needs you're forgiven everything all of it but you haven't gone to the cross yet I know forgiven but is there something I need to do in order to get the forgiveness forgiven but but don't you Uh, love the sinner but hate the sin and that's why we really forgive it but what if i'm not really sincere like i say i'm sorry but i'm not really sorry because i keep on doing forgive it all of your sins forgive it the good news is that jesus christ has forgiven you let that sink in jesus christ has forgiven you. Can I say this? And this, this, will be the, this will be the absolute last thing that I'll say that'll probably make you upset with me. He forgave you before he even went to the cross. If you don't understand that, then you miss the meaning of the cross. 
The cross did not happen in order for God to forgive us. The cross happened because God did forgive us. He was slain from the foundations of the world, not because he was strapped to a cruel tree, because from the very beginning, he said to Adam and Eve, I forgive you. And watch this, even Lucifer in heaven, he said the same thing, I forgive you. Lucifer just didn't want any of it. But how about you? Do you want it? Are you willing to trust in God's love and forgiveness for you? I know, I know, you're going to do the but, 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 I know, I know, I know. But the news is so good, I had to tell you. The road to the cross is paved with forgiveness all the way. You were born forgiven. And even at the end of time, those who are lost will be forgiven. Just like Lucifer, they didn't want to live with God. That's all it is. But their sins, Jesus also paid for and forgave. Do you believe that? If there's someone here today that just simply wants to make this stand, you're saying, it is the hardest thing for me to do is to forgive others, and it's hard for me to forgive myself, so I can't believe that God would actually forgive me. If that is your struggle, and you want to get to a point where you can fully accept God's forgiveness in your life. No strings attached, nothing you have to do in order to get it. It's already been imparted to you, already been justified, freely justified. If that's where you are, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. This is for those who struggle with this. There's some people, I know you guys don't struggle with it. You, you feel good about the forgiveness. But there's some here that struggle with it. And you want to make that stand. Because I'm telling you right now, when you are able to really accept that from God, it unlocks something in your relationships with others. I see you standing. Is anybody else? I see you standing. This is not, do you want to be saved? Stand if you want to be lost. I'm not saying that. Very specific here, very specific. The road to the cross, it begins and even ends with forgiveness. There's someone else here. You've been, hearing, you've been carrying away. You, you, you've, been, you've been a faithful Christian, a faithful Adventist, and you're still stressing about your salvation, stressing if you've done enough. And God says, no, you didn't do enough. I did. Where sin abounds, grace that much more abounds. Is anyone else? Let us pray. Father God, I want to thank you so much for just taking the time to connect with us in this way. Father, this message, I'm going to keep it honest, be real with you. This is going to be hard for a lot of us to accept because right now it sounds easy. Right now it sounds way too easy, way too simple, way too light. This, this, is, this sounds almost like the cheap gospel, and this is, this is what other people might be preaching, and, and, and we have a distinct message, and this does not feel right in our spirit. But Father, every time that we are tempted to think it's cheap. May we look at the scars in your hands and know it wasn't cheap. Anytime that we think it's just too easy, may we look at your back and see the stripes that bring healing and know that that burden was absolutely heavy for you, not for us. May we really be able to embrace the good news, not because we're good or because we earn it or deserved it, because you are good and you earned it and you deserve to live with your babies forevermore. So we choose to get out of the way. Let those who are paralytics paralyzed in their sin to come draw near to you. They won't have to rip apart the roof. We'll open up the church doors for them. They will have a bed in this hospital, in this church, as long as they need it. If it takes them 40 years, we already were expecting it to take a while because we learned that sanctification is a work of a lifetime, so we have time. May we be good patients in this hospital 
because we know where we have failed and we know where you have succeeded. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for the reminder of our value, Jesus. In your name, we say all these things. Amen. forgiving you. Go in peace.